Right, Titus chapter 2. We're going to carry on and finish off last week's message. Last week's message, we started off with Christ appearing and reward. I'm not going to talk much about the appearing. I want to talk about the judgment seat of Christ a little bit this morning and finish that thought off. I'm not doing an in-depth study of the judgment seat of Christ, but I want to give you a couple of things to look at and consider in that. But let's read Titus chapter 2 from verse 11 um, th through um, 13 there. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's read the last two verses too. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar p people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. And so over the last couple of weeks we've been talking about Christ appearing. He said not just going to appear for us the body of Christ. And by the way it is appearing for us the body of Christ. It's only the believers, only you and I that will see him at that appearing. When he's appearing for us, the world won't see him. But at the second coming, that will be a different uh, scenario that plays off at the second coming. But at his appearing there, and we talked about Israel and their reward they will receive. And so then I started talking about, uh, um, you know, when, we, when Jesus Christ comes and we are, we are caught up... Um, we get, obviously get changed. Those that, are, that died in the Lord, they, they receive their glorified body, their new glorified body, and we are changed. And so we, so we together meet the Lord in the air, and from meeting the Lord in the air, we're going to the judgment seat of Christ. And um, as I said to you last week, I know there is some folks in the gray circles that don't believe there is a judgment seat of Christ. Okay, uh, I, am, I am persuaded, I am uh, in, my, in, in my own understanding, that there is a judgment seat of Christ. And in this judgment seat of Christ, we all will be part of that. We all will be standing at that judge being Christ. Before Christ presents us to the Father, a, a, a holy church, unblameable. But um, we know we're standing in righteousness before God. We, stand, we are holy and unblameable in Christ Jesus, but we get presented. Look at first. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, if you will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13 says, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end. He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father. Now when is He going to do that? When is He going to establish our hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father? Look at the next part of the verse. It says, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. So we get presented to the Father, a holy and blameable, spotless church, glorified, and having a body like unto the Lord Jesus Christ. That's something to look forward to, right? And so we're all looking forward to that. And then you said we get to the body judgment seat of Christ. There's three passages in your Bibles that talks about the judgment seat of Christ, specifically in um, more in detail, if I would say that. So. There's other places alerting to that. But go with me to Romans chapter 14. In one hand, open Romans chapter 14. And in the other, in the other hand, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And then with your one foot. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Romans chapter 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll start off with Romans chapter 14. And so what we've said, I said this in closing last time, and we'll just start off there where I closed off last time. Every member of the body of Christ will give an account at the judgment seat of Christ. And we will, every one of us, account at the judgment seat of Christ, will be a one-on-one -on -one account giving. We're not going to say, see this person or see that person. It's their fault. It's, it, because I didn't do this, it's their fault. No, no, you can't. Everyone will give an account of himself before God. Okay? And so Romans chapter 14, if you will, and look at verse 10. 
But why? Now, now, and we know what Romans chapter 14 is about, right? Everybody knows what Romans 14 is about. You know how you, as, as believers in the body of Christ, how do you treat other members of the body of Christ that has a different persuasion than you? Maybe some don't eat meat and others do eat meat. Some celebrate certain holy days and others don't celebrate some holy days. And all those things are based on the, on the, on the fact of your maturity. Right? The more mature you are, the more things you understand. But if, you're not, if you don't have full understanding and you don't have, you know, don't judge your brother. He's doing it as unto the Lord you know, etc. But we're not going to talk about the details of that. Verse 10 says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou say that not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Who shall all stand? We shall all. Why do you judge your brother? Of course, we shall all stand. So definitely Paul is not just talking about himself and the other apostles. He's talking about us all. Right? We all shall. Verse 11 says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So everyone shall give an account of what? Himself to God. Right? So keep that in mind. We'll come back to this passage. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to read verse... Um, we're going to read there from verse 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And verse 10 says, well, let's go read verse 9 as well. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So you receive to what you've done in the body. Done with what? What have you done? What's the only thing that you as a believer can do in the body of Christ that is acceptable? And if you don't do this, it's not acceptable. Are you accepted in Christ Jesus? Are you made accepted in the beloved? Are you blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places? Yes. Do we have the imputed righteousness of Christ? Yes, right? Are we complete in Him? We have all those things, right? In Christ Jesus, that's our positional standing before God. You, you with me? But so, uh, what are we going to give an account for? What, what is it that we can do that's good or bad? That's the only thing that you can do good. Like 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 7 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture. Genesis to Revelation. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for what? For doctrine, what God's Word teaches us. For, 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 for doctrine, for, for reproof, for correction. Uh, for, for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instru instruction and righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. What's going to furnish you unto all good works? It's the Word of God. So if you're not in the Word of God, what can't you produce? Good works. Why does Jesus Christ save us? Does He save us unto good works? Does He want to have a church, a body of Christ that's zealous of good works? How do we do good works? Because of something I decide to do or because of what God is doing in me by His Word? There's a difference. One is the work of my flesh, and the other one is a work of Christ working in me. Before men, I wouldn't know if, 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 if John does something, I'm like, is that in the flesh or is it in the spirit? I would like to think it's in the spirit because this is the word of God affects you working in it. But she could feign the faith and do a good work and be nice to people, but it's not because she believes God's word. That's a different thing. One is you have confidence in your flesh and your ability. The other one is your confidence is in God and His faithfulness because He is faithful, He's working in us that believes. Right? So that's the good works you're going to, and that's what we, in those works, it's going to represent our work that we do, and that's the work that we'll give an account for. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul's talking about being laborers. He's talking about Apollos and, and, and other leaders himself. Verse 9. In the church at that day stage, there was people that was like, I'm of Apollos and I'm of Paul. Paul says, listen, neither is he anything that, you know, one plants, the other one waters. We nothing but God it gives the increase. 
For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereupon. But let every man take heed how he built thereupon. So every man has to take heed how you build on the foundation. What's the foundation? Well, the verse, verse 11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So you build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Paul lays the foundation. That foundation is laid out for us very clearly in Romans. And the details of the cross, right? And so we build upon that. Now, verse 12 says, Now if any man uh, built upon this, uh, sorry, now if any man built upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day, it says, here's the point, every man's work. So every man has a work. I'm going to show you later on that you don't just, every man has a work, but every man has an account. Okay, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. What day? Well, that day when he's coming for us and we caught up in the judgment seat of Christ. The day shall declare it. Uh, uh, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work what sort it is. What is fire in the Bible a, 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 a symbol of? And what does fire represent in the Bible? Judgment, right? And so, if any man's work abide, which he hath built upon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, so as by fire. So one thing we do know, we all, if you, for you to get to the judgment seat of Christ, you have to be saved. There's no, un, there's no people that's uh, unbelievers at the judgment seat of Christ. They're all believers, right? We're all saved at the judgment seat of Christ, okay? Um, but we'll, our work will be tried of what sort of us. But every one of us will give an account of our, and will receive, a, uh, uh, um, and, we, and, and the scripture talks about reward, okay? The judgment seat of Christ, there will be a reward in this passage we just see, or a loss of reward. Go back, keep your hands in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, 3 here, but go back, back with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this, this reward that we will get, or the loss of reward, is according to the good or the bad we have done. Alright? Verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. So you have a body. Who dwells in dwells your body? Obviously you. You have a soul and a spirit, right? In your body. But in that soul and spirit, in that body, our body is called the temple of what? The Holy Ghost. We are the temple of God, right? And so what have we done in our body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad? If you do good, you do it according to God's word working in you. If you do bad... You're not doing God's word. You're not doing it according to God's word in you. You're doing the wrong thing. And so we'll give an account for that, every one of us. Now, note this. I said this last week, and I'm, and I'm going to take you some verses. At the judgment seat of Christ, none of us, as believers, will give an account for our sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? All my sin has been paid for. All my sin has been paid for. Do you guys agree with that? He's forgiven us all trespasses. All sins has been taken care of. All sins has been nailed to the cross. We have, as the body of Christ, received the forgiveness of what? Sins. Do you have forgiveness of sins? Yes or yes? Yes, we have forgiveness of sins. So we cannot come to the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for our sin. We will give an account for what we have done with what God has given us in our inheritance. What God has given us in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. What have you done with that? Because He's blessed you with all spiritual blessings in every places. He's made you complete. He's given you His Word. It works effectually in you. What did you do with that? You know? 
And so, so let's go look at a couple of verses to show you that your sins are forgiven us. Because, you know, although you say, well, I know those verses, let me tell you something. Every time I read those verses, I cannot but thank God that my sin problem has been solved and been taken care of. And I don't have to work for the rest of my life to sort my sin problem out. Because if it was up to me, I will fail and I will go to hell, period. I cannot, I, I know myself. God knows me better than I know myself. There's no way that I, can, that I can take care of my sin problem. That's why Christ died for my sin. Go with me to uh, Colossians, the book of Colossians, if you will. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I'm actually using, a, I'm starting to use a, a new Bible here. And um, that's got no writing in it, no notes in it. No underlying, no highlights, because, you know, you start preaching with the Bible, they have all the highlights and the notes, and guess, you go through and you see the note, and then before it, you chase a rabbit trail down there, and I'm trying not to do that, I'm trying to stick with what we wanted to do here, but Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14, Colossians chapter 1 verse 14, it says there, you know, well let's go read verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. You know, he's qualified us to be partakers, all right? Verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. You know, there is a deliverance that needs to take place. And for you to be delivered from the power of darkness to the kingdom of his dear Son, you have to come to a place where you believe the gospel. If you haven't come to a place where you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, you're still in darkness possibly. I don't know, you know. But I'm just saying if you have not come to that place where you've realized Christ died for your sins and you came short of the glory of God and all you need to do is to believe God and, 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 and the gift He's given you, the gift of eternal life through the finished work of Christ, and when you believe in Christ's finished work of the cross, it, you are translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. Okay? And <coughs> translating the kingdom of his dear son, verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood. We have, we don't work towards redemption, we have redemption. We have been set free by the paying of, of the price of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. All right? We, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of what? It doesn't say sin, it says sins. All our sins has been taken care of, you know. And by the way, I wish you say one, two, three, and everybody should jump at us and praise God, hallelujah. Let's get Pentecost. No, 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 no. We've got something to be excited about. Don't we? You know? You know, we like, yeah, praise God, hallelujah, I'm saved. Hey, so great. Don't show me excitement. I don't want to show anybody how excited I am to be saved, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> Just, just not people think I'm charismatic or something like that, you know. No, be charismatic. Don't be a charismatic believer, but be charismatic. You know, be excited about what you believe. You know, don't be ashamed of it, man. We have the forgiveness of sins. Go with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And by the way, that forgiveness of sins you received, it's a once-off transaction. It's a once-off transaction. That moment you believe, that moment you translate it, you receive the forgiveness of sins. Right? You go, you go to Romans chapter 4, right? But keep your finger there. My mind's going somewhere else. Go with me to Acts 26. The book of Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Verse, verse 18, Acts 26 and verse 18. I talked about that once off transaction, the forgiveness of sins happens one time, the moment you believe. Your sin and my sin has been dealt with and paid for where? At Calvary, at the cross. When do we receive the forgiveness of sins? It's stamped and it's based in the finished work of Christ. But for you to receive it, you have to do what? You have to believe. 
You have to trust what the gospel says. Look at Acts 26 verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Not that, that they have already received. They have to receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. If you want an inheritance and the forgiveness of sins, what do you need to do? You need to believe the gospel. Without the belief the gospel, you don't have an inheritance. Without believing the gospel, your sins are not forgiven. Right? And so we have received the... Back to Romans chapter 4. I, I wanted to show you that just so that you know from the power of darkness, to the power of, from the power of Satan, to the power of darkness to the, the kingdom of his son. But in Romans chapter 4, verse 6 to 8. Well, let's go 4. Sorry. Somebody has asked me already, he says, like, why do you preachers always say, go to this verse, and then you read a verse to, it's always context. You know, it's always try to get context. Romans chapter 4, verse 4 says, Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that is justified the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Is our, is our, is our sins, uh, is our iniquities forgiven and is our sins for, uh, covered? Yes, because of the potential of Christ. Now, I know David is speaking this prophetically. He's talking this under the dispensation of the kingdom. I understand that. But there's a horizontal truth that's going on here that we have to keep in mind. Our sin problem has been taken care of. Last passage on that, if you will go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32. Verse 32 says, And be ye kind one to another. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the body of Christ. He's talking to us. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath. You see that word hath? Forgiven us. You and I are forgiven. Our sin problem has been taken care of. So there's no way that you and I will get to the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for our sin. Because our sin problem has been solved, has been taken care of because of Christ. Right? So we've, 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 we, we know that, we understand that from the Scriptures. And, and so we rest in that. And, and because of that, we are kind to one another and forgive one another. Because God, for Christ's sake, you know, I, w I say this from time to time, and it sounds, it sounds, I guess it could sound bad, but think about this. God the Father, if we believe the gospel and we trust the gospel, does God the Father have the option to not forgive us? If we believe the gospel and we trust the gospel, does God the Father have the option not to forgive us? No. He has to forgive us. For Christ's sake. Otherwise His Son died for nothing. You understand what I'm saying? He's forgiven us because we believe the gospel. But you've got to believe it, right? And so He, he hath forgiven us. And that's something we need to rejoice in because that's not what we're going to give an answer for. We have the imputed righteousness of God. Look at me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So I'm going to stand. I'm in righteousness positionally. This is who God has made me to be. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. He says, For He, that's God the Father, for He, verse 21, that's God the Father, for He hath made Him, that's Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. He's made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Christ didn't know sin, but he made him to be sin for us. Okay? He didn't become a sinner. He took care of our sin problem. He died in our, for our sin problem. Sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness 
of God in him, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now you look at your own life, and you examine your own life, and you stand in a mirror today or tomorrow or tonight, whenever you want to do, okay, and you look at your own life, and you examine your own self, and you look at yourself, and you, you think about your life that you're living, and the life that you walk, and, the, and, the, and as a believer, you know, you, you look at yourself, and can you look at yourself and say, man, what a righteous dude. I can't. Because I fail. Right? But God, the Father, made Jesus to be sin for us. And, and when we believe the gospel, He imputes Jesus Christ's righteousness to us. And He makes us righteous in Christ Jesus. So you and I cannot go to the judgment seat of Christ and say, I'm going to have to account for my sin. Right? Because my sin problem has been taken care of. We have to understand that. Because Christ is making intercession for us. What the judgment seat of Christ is about, and we have to understand that, is about the evalu evaluation of our work we have done as believers. God had a purpose when He saved us for the body of Christ. That ultimate purpose is going to be reigning in the heavenly places. Right? But while we're waiting for that, Paul uses the terminology obey, seek, set, let, mortify. He's using that terminology over and over. Right? So we need to let some things go based on what? Based on the Word of God that you read. You read the Word of God and you respond by faith or you don't respond by faith. And by the way, if you don't read the Word of God, you don't have the option to respond by faith. You've got to read the Word of God to respond by faith and believe what God's Word is saying. For it to work in you, you've got to believe it and you've got to look and consider it because that's how it works in us. It's a living Word. That's how it, the, the process works. Okay? It's about our work. What if we build with... Go back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 again. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. How did we build upon this foundation? We have all the materials. Would you, would you agree with me when you get saved, you get blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Is there anything else that you need in your life besides of what you have in Christ Jesus to be complete? No, you're complete, right? Then you have the completed Word of God that He's not just given by inspiration, but He's also preserved it for us. You and I have it preserved for us in the King James Bible that we believe is the ultimate, final authority of the Word of God. It's inerrant, it's without fault, it's God's perfect Word, and we trust it, we believe it, and it works in us that believes. Right? That's what we believe. So it, it's a purpose to accomplish, to furnish us unto all good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That we should be zealous of good works. That's what He wants us to be. Zealous of good works. To, get, to, to do the good works, we have to believe. Right? And you guys know the verses. I've spoken... I'm going to say this. I'm going to repeat this verses. Um, for those... Uh, keep your hands at 1 Corinthians. And go with me to 1 Thessalonians. And I'm just doing this for the purpose of those listening online that has maybe not heard this before. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. I want to show you here that what works in you is the Word of God, the Word of truth. Without the Word of truth, you don't have the Word of God working in you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, uh, chapter 2, sorry. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. All right, you guys have that? Look at the verse. It says. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God. So something happens. When you receive the truth, the word of God, which is in his book now, in this Bible, preserved for us, right? The word of God, which he says, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that what? So what works in us that believes? Now we know it's God, right? But what does God use to work in us that believes? His Word. And so what have you done with that? How have you responded to what God has given you? Because I used an example. I have a, I have a cell phone, alright? 
the cell phone, uh, um, <laughs> when I got the cell phone, you know, well, you know, we get the new ones every two years, three years. Me, it's more like three or four years I get a new one, okay? Some people get every new one that comes out, they get another one. You know, that, uh, that's okay. But this cell phone, if I, only, if I have this cell phone and I only use it to get calls, or I only use it to make a call, and maybe on the odd occasion a text message, some people don't even text. They still got flip phones. I'm, I'm, can you believe that some people still have flip phones? I'm not even going to mention names. This guy here, okay? <laughs> you can't even send him a text message, all right? But, you know, but if I only use it for, for making calls and receiving calls, am I using the full ability of this phone? Then I can just as well buy myself a flip phone. This is a waste of money and time, right? But, this, this, but, but on this phone... You know, if I want to get somewhere, I'm like, okay, Google Maps, boop, 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 and it's, it comes onto my screen in the car, and now Google is looking for something. Um, it heard me say something, you know, but and so it comes on the screen in the car, and I can, and it will guide me there, and even if there's a crash or an accident, it'll tell me, you're going to go, this is the fastest route, and it will let me go around that. Or if I come, I'm in South Africa or in Zambia, I'm like, ooh, I forgot to pay the mortgage. Guess what? Poop on my phone, go into my bank, transfer my funds, mortgage paid. So this, this phone can do so much more than I use it for. You and I in Christ Jesus, we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We have the imputed righteousness of God. He has, he has enabled us to be this zealous people of good works. And what have you done with that? And for you to find out what you can do is, I have to go into the instruction manual to find out what this phone can do and learn about the abilities. The phone can do it whether I do it or not. The phone tells me it, it is, it's embedded in there. I just got to get into instruction manual to find out what it can do. For you, what you can do as a believer and what we can do as believers, it's been given to us in Christ. We just need to find out what is He blessed us with. And what did you do with that? It's just good for me to get out of hell. I'm not going to go to hell. I have eternal life, so I don't care about the rest. No. We're saved with a purpose. And so we need to give attention to that. All right? And so we'll be evaluated. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It's the Word of God that effectually works in us. That word effectually, by the way, I say it over and over. Effectual means it, it produces the desired result. God has an intent. He's designed His Word, that form of doctrine that He put in His Word. It's designed to accomplish a result. When you believe the Word, the result's accomplished. When you don't believe the Word, you, don't have the, you can't have the result. I use the result, you know, for maybe some of the boat guys. I know there's a couple of boat guys here. But Todd used to build boats. Now he paints boats. You know, it's more profitable for him to paint boats than to build them now, right? But... We used to build boats, and I used to come there, and they have these big old molds out there, and it's lying out there in the backyard. And then somebody orders a 42-footer or something like that, or 38-footer or whatever it is, and he brings those molds out there, and he starts polishing those molds and clean them up, and, and he puts some real good wax on them, and then he starts spraying it with a gel coat, you know, and then he starts... But then he starts putting in the, 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 the fiberglass and he puts the stringers in and he starts doing all those various things. So he's building this boat in the form that it's designed to be. So when he's finished building this boat, he pulls out those plugs, he pulls out the boat, and the boat is exactly what the guy ordered on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the picture that he ordered. That's the boat I want. The mold produces that boat and it's exactly what the person wants. The, the, the doctrine is that mold, that form of doctrine, is that form that you and I need to get in. And when we get into that form and we do it according to the form that God has laid out for us, we become what God has designed it to be, effectual working, the, the, producing the result that God wants it to produce. But to do that, you've got to get into the form of words. If you mess up the form of words, you don't get the, you know, you can't just put stringers in and then go put a gel coat over that, right? What's going to happen with that boat? It's going to fall apart. Okay? You've got to be very particular to fall the patterns, or else you're going to start peeling off at the back. I'm just joking with somebody now. It's about to start peeling off at the back. <laughs> All right, so, so it has to be done right or you're not going to get the perfect thing that God designed it for it to, in our lives to be. We have to obey that form of doctrine. 
First Corinthians chapter 3. We're building on a foundation. What sort it is? First Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, of what, uh, 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 and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Our work collectively will be tried. Every one of us. Every one of us here today. Every believer. Our work will be tried what sort it is. What sort, what has your life produced in Christ? What God has produced you to be. How did you respond to that? How by faith did you walk and, and approve those things that God has given you and believing the scriptures? Okay. It's about, you know, so when Paul prays for the body of Christ, when Paul is praying for the body of Christ, he's praying, you know, that, that God will fill you with a, a knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may know, right? So he's praying for knowledge, wisdom, and understanding for the body of Christ. That's what he wants us to do. And I believe that God wants you and I to have not just have the knowledge of the Word, because if you have the knowledge of God's Word without the wisdom and spiritual understanding, all you have is knowledge, and knowledge puffs you up. Right? Your knowledge will say, all my sins are forgiven, you know, where sin abounded, grace did much abound, so I can live on sinning. Could you? No, you can. Should you? No. Because the wisdom and understanding tells you, no, you should not. You understand? And so he's praying for knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. I believe, and, and, and it's, my, it's my understanding that, with that, 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 that wisdom and knowledge and understanding is wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. So gold, did I just say the same thing twice? Gold, silver, and precious stones is wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. That's what we will try. Not just for your knowledge, but for the wisdom and spiritual understanding, which makes the complete man in your walk. Show, I will show you a couple of passages. Go with me to Proverbs. Now remember gold, silver, and precious stones. Keep your hand in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and go with me to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. And Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 16. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 16. Now remember I said gold, silver, precious stones. Verse 16 of Proverbs, chapter 16 and verse 16. You guys have that? Proverbs 16, 16 it says, How much better is it to get wisdom than what? So gold is equal to what? Wisdom. And to get understanding rather than chosen silver. So silver, understanding, gold, Wisdom. You have with me? So it's, it's likened like that in Scripture. Go with me to chapter 20, if you will. Go with me to chapter 20 and verse 15. Chapter 20 and verse 15. Chapter 20 of Proverbs, verse 15 says, There is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious, what do you see there? Jewel. Precious stones. Understanding our knowledge is precious what? Stones. Gold. Wisdom. Uh, gold. Silver and precious stones. Wisdom. Understanding and knowledge. You guys get that? You can look at the scriptures. Go with me. Uh, while you're in Proverbs, go with me to chapter 24 quickly. 24 verse 4. Proverbs 24 verse 4. And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with precious and pleasant riches. You see the riches, gold, silver, and precious stones has got to do with, you know, riches. I actually like verse in your chapter 24, but we're not going to talk about this too much. But verse 14, look at verse 14 quickly, 24. I like this verse. 
So shall the knowledge of wisdom be in thy soul. When thou hast found it, then there shall be a reward, and thy expectation shall not be cut off. There's a reward associated with what? Man, can't believe that. Thank you. There's a reward associated with knowledge and wisdom. So Paul says you'll receive a reward for what you've done, right? Gold, silver, and precious stones. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. In that order with the stones and what I've just said, right? And so, so there is a reward system associated with that. Now, you will say, so if you put gold, silver, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you take gold, silver, and precious stones, and you put it into a fire, a furnace of fire, what will happen? It will not burn up, it will remain. If there's impurities in it, it will clean it out, right? But you, th that good work will remain. That work will remain. But if it's wood, hay, and stubble, what happens with wood, hay, and stubble? It just burns up. And I think wood, hay, and stubble, as you and I, as you and I, uh, um, that's not, we not, when we get wood, hay, and stubble, it's because we're not studying God's Word. We're not receiving God's Word. We're not in God's Word. And we're not rightly dividing God's Word. I want you to go with me to Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 21. Uh, 22, sorry. Jeremiah chapter 4. It's a good thing I'm in this Bible. It takes me longer to get there now. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22. I, I took one of those cheap Bibles, one of those cardboard Bible covers at the back there, and I put a leather cover on it, and, um, and I try to be very meticulous about it, but now I have some pages that's been glued together, so that happens. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22. For my people is foolish, talking about Israel, my people is foolish, they have not known me, you see knowledge, they have not known me, they are sottish children, sottish means what? They're stupid, you know. They are sottish children, and they have none understanding, they are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. You see wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in that passage. Why do they have not any of those things? And why are they wise to evil? It's because they don't believe God's Word. And the same way when you and I don't handle God's Word correctly and don't follow the form, we will get wood, hay, and stubble. Wood, hay, and stubble is like telling somebody, listen, if you want to be saved and you want to have eternal life, you have to be water baptized. That will be wood. Hay and stubble. Now, if somebody says that, they, pass, they, were not, they won't even have wood, hay and stubble because they'll go to hell if they trust that water baptism to save them. You understand what I'm saying? Because the only thing that saves us. So God's purpose for us is, and, and I need to get on. You and I will give an account. Go with me to Philippians quickly. Philippians chapter 4. My time is up just basically. In Philippians chapter 4, you and I in Philippians 1.10 says we need to approve things that are excellent. How do you approve things that are excellent? Well, you get into God's Word. You study it so you can approve excellent things. If you don't know God's Word, how can you approve excellent things? Because excellent things come from God's Word. But in Philippians 4 and verse 17, I want to show you that you have an account and I have an account. Philippians 4 verse... Let's go uh, verse 16. Philippians 4 from verse 16. For even in Thessalonica, he's talking to the Philippians, you sent once again unto my necessity. So Paul had necessities, he had needs. And the people from Philippi sent him supplies or money or whatever they supplied. He had necessities, so they helped him with that. Verse 17. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit. He wants fruit from the believers, that, may, that it may abound to your what? Account. So the Philippians have an account. And I think you and I have an account. But I have all and abound. I'm full and etc. etc. I'm not going to read the rest of that now. Go with me quickly. So we have an account I showed you there. And I want you to go back to Romans chapter 14. And if you don't want to go there, just listen to that. Romans chapter 14 verse 12 again. Verse 12 says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself. We have an account, and what do you do with an account? You'll give an account. 
you know, is this book balancing? Is it doing what it needs to be do? We will give an account, okay? And that's what, you know, that's what you and I have. We have a reward. And, and, and that reward is going to receive about what we've done, whether it's be good or bad. And if it's bad, we suffer the loss of reward. That means we are not rewarded. Right? It's the same principle in the kingdom with the, with, with the believing remnant of Israel. Some of had ten talents and five talents and one talent. What did you do with these talents? Did you use them? At the second coming of Christ, you'll judge them. Oh, you did not. You just buried it? Oh, man, come on. I'm going to give this to that. That guy will be over so many. They get it rewarded accordingly. And I believe you and I get rewarded accordingly. All right? What have we done with what Christ has given us? And, 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 and my time is up, but Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23 and 24 and 25. And then we'll close up in, in there in Titus. Colossians chapter 3 verse 24, 23, 24 and 25. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men knowing that of the Lord he shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Do we all have an inheritance? Do we all receive an inheritance? But we also receive a reward of the inheritance, right? For, for, for ye serve the Lord Jesus Christ. What did you do with your inheritance that God has promised you? and you? How did you use this? But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there's no respect of persons. God will deal righteously. Jesus Christ will deal righteously at the judgment seat of Christ. What have we done with what God has given us? And in closing, Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. At his appearing, he's going to, looking for that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. Verse 14 says, who gave himself for us that he may redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works that's why he saved us unto to be zealous of what good works the opposite of that is look at chapter 1 verse 16 they profess that they know God but in works they deny him now they profess that they know God but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and every good work reprobate. How can you be abominable, disobedient, and every good work reprobate, lost to grace? How can you be that? You can be that by not being in God's word. You can be that by not letting the word of God effectually work in you. You can have it a flesh. God's not interested in the work of our flesh. Just the same with Israel. They seek him not by the right. They seek him by the righteousness of their own flesh. They didn't seek him according to the knowledge he's provided for them according to his word. That's the problem. And the same principle with you and I. He saved us for a purpose. We are saved unto all good works. We should walk in them. That's after all what he did. And so next time we're going to come together and we're going to talk about our, our great God. Looking for that blessed open, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the great God. You know, as the Son, He's the great God. He's also referred as the Lord of Righteousness. Capital O, L, capital O, capital R, capital D of Righteousness. That's Jesus Christ. It's referred to as that. Him and the Father is one. And we'll talk about the great God, and, the, and, 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 and then we'll talk about our salvation that He's bought for us. And we'll talk about it. I hope this helps. I hope this gives some understanding about the judgment seat of Christ. We're not judged for, our, for, for our, um, our sin. We'll be judged for what have we done with you giving us. If I give you something and I say, yes, $10, you know, use it because I want you to, make, to use it well and you don't use it. You know, how can I reward you if you don't use it? In the same way, people get a job. The job is like if you work from... You know, need 40 hours a week, you get a 40 hours pay. But if you don't work 40 hours a week, how can I pay you for what you've not done? And so we'll be evaluated with what God has given us in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. How did we respond by faith to that? Now you may say, well, Des, I'm just learning these things. I've never had them in my life. I've never, ne nobody told me that. Nobody showed me that. 
How do I go about it? You know, just take it one step at a time, one verse at a time, believe it and trust it, let God do the work. God is faithful and just. I will, I will not judge you at the judgment seat of Christ, and I thank God that I'm not. I will not. Right? Neither will you judge me. You may judge me right now for going over time. But at the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus Christ will say, hey, listen, I've given you everything that you need. What did you do with that? How faithful were you? And in the body of Christ, there's always saints. In the, all, everybody in the body of Christ is saints. Ephesians 1 verse 1 says, saints. And then in the body of Christ, those are the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm, uh, we all here yeah, want to be the, referred to as the faithful in Christ Jesus, right? So to do that, we just need to believe God's word, you know? Start where you're at. And if you don't know where to start, ask us. We'll be love, we would love to help you to understand and to grow in grace. Because it's the word of His grace that builds us up. Nothing else. Father, we thank You for Your grace. We thank You for Your great love. We thank You for that the judgment seat of Christ is not something that we have to fear in, 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 in tribulation and in, in, in anguish, but something that we can look forward to. We pray that we will use the time and redeem the time because the days are evil. We will put on your word and put on the righteousness and that your word is provided for us, that we believe and trust your word as it works in us effectually. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the saints here. And we thank you for your great love as we pray this with, with thanksgiving by Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen.